Musical Hell is hitting the high seas next year. Check out the video information to find out how you can join me and the hit musical Six on the Norwegian Bliss. This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Ah, Disney, my old frenemy, we meet again. It seems like only a month ago you were in my court answering for your mediocre teen romances with poorly thought-out metaphors, and yet you return to face more charges of musical malfeasance. I suppose given the breadth of your media empire, it is inevitable that some of your offerings would be... less than stellar. And yet, it has not escaped my notice that you always seem to be in my court for the most shameless and obvious of your cash grabs. Case in point, our next offender, The Country Bears. This hairball of a film comes to us from the early 2000s, when movies based on theme park rides were Disney's IP exploitation du jour, roughly a year before the formula yielded a franchise treasure trove, which they needed after this movie barely made half of its $35 million budget, most of which shows up on screen in the form of special costuming effects and assorted cameos at least some of whom must have wondered if being on the mouse's payroll was worth this. So, regrettably, let's examine the case of the Country Bears. We open with a montage of the titular Ursine's glory days, as presented by a behind-the-music knockoff being watched by a little bear cub. I learned a lot from those guys, and that was why I was so sad to see them break up. Oh, Willie Nelson, I know you had your issues with the tax man, but it didn't have to come to this. This is Barry Barrington. Yes, really. And he's obsessed with the country bears, even though they broke up a decade ago, probably because there's a limited number of fursuit performers in the music community. Or, for that matter, his own family. Mom, am I adopted? (laughs) Of course not, honey. Barry's dad, you know. Ned! Ryerson! Assures Barry it's okay to be different, everyone has a purpose, climb every mountain, ford every stream, yada yada. But Big Brother Dex is the only one willing to call out the grizzly in the room, and he's also a bit tired of being subjected to Barry's fixation, so he pulls out the receipts on his origins. See this? This is my birth certificate. Here's yours. Barry is heartbroken, at least I think he is with that vaguely neutral expression. The bear characters in this movie are provided by the good people at Jim Henson's Creature Shop, and their work here ranks somewhere below dinosaurs, but above Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's still distracting enough to earn sin number one. Packing a few changes of clothes and his Chekhov's tracking collar, Barry decides to journey to Country Bear Hall, where he feels he belongs. Mostly because a talking poster told him to. At Country Bear Hall, you could be different and still fit in. While his family wrings their hands over his runaway note, Barry travels to the hall and stop me if you've heard this one. It's a bit run down, the owner Henry is way behind in his payments, and the evil banker who holds the mortgage is just chomping at the bit to turn the place into kindling. How many times do we have to see this tired routine? How many greedy rich assholes do you know who go around wrecking architecture for petty spiteful okay point taken? It's still an overused trope and this movie does nothing interesting with it, so sin number two there. Anyway, $20,000 is the magic number Henry needs to put together in four days, or stock Christopher Walken villain Reed Thimble will raise Country Bear Hall to the ground. Barry is quite disheartened to learn his own personal mecca may not be long for this world. Tear down Country Bear Hall? Yeah. Tear down Country Bear Hall? Yes, kid. Sweet Lucifer, I thought your hearing was supposed to be twice as good as a human's. Convinced that saving the hall is his grand purpose in life, Barry urges Henry to get the band back together and hold a concert to raise the money. Because, in case you haven't figured it out yet, this is basically the Blues Brothers with fur. And no decent songs. Or jokes. Henry is skeptical, but his groundskeeper, Big Al, is more optimistic. Oh, Al. Look, let's face it. In a week from now, 
Some teenager's gonna be teaching us how to operate a deep fryer. We could do that. But then Big Al's not the brightest star in Ursa Major, so... Back at the Barringtons, the distraught parents have enlisted officers Ham and Cheats, yes, really, to find their missing son. Does he have any distinguishing marks, something that we can recognize him by? Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, he's got thick brown hair all over his body. Okay, the running gag of Dex being the only person in the family who acknowledges that Barry is a bear is getting old fast, but more importantly, it points to a major flaw in the film. It can't quite figure out how to handle the basic premise of its central characters being anthropomorphic animals. The simplest, and in my opinion best option here, is to treat the bears like an accepted reality of the universe, like the tunes in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. A person will recognize that they're talking to an animated character, but this isn't seen as anything unnatural or extraordinary. They're just part of the diversity that surrounds them. And that seems to be what this movie is trying for. There's even a scene in a bar clearly designed to cater to an ursine demographic. But then you realize that the main characters are pretty much the only bipedal talking bears we ever see, and the premise doesn't hold. Then there are the characters who just seem to ignore the fact that the bears are bears, almost to the point of being oblivious to the fact. Meanwhile, Dex is standing to the side yelling the obvious truth like the one observant character in a chicken boo short, calling attention to the weirdness instead of inviting the audience to roll with it, and causing them to ask the questions a better movie would have them cheerfully dismissing. Back at Bear Hall, Henry's daily reminiscing is interrupted by Barry singing one of the Country Bear's old hits. He's not bad for whatever the bear equivalent of ten is, plus those claws probably make for good guitar picks in a pinch. The performance convinces Henry to go along with the get the band back together idea, and he has just the thing they need for the purpose, a dilapidated, colorful mode of transportation. The bus comes complete with Rhodey, the band's former drummer and the human of the group. His one personality trait is that he has a pet chicken, which is even less of a trait than it sounds like. Leaving Big Al behind to tidy the place up, the three travel by undercranked montage to pick up the first band member, Fred, who is working security on a music video set. Sorry, got to be part of the video shoot. I kind of am the video shoot. Hmm? Oh, Crystal, hey, sorry. Like every cameo artist in this movie, Crystal is a big fan of the Bears and invites Fred to jam with them on her random music video. This song has We Were Really, Really Hoping This Would Be The Breakout Hit Of The Movie written all over it. Let's just say it's no We Don't Talk About Bruno. Fred is amenable to a reunion concert, but asks how they're going to promote it. Barry suggests the band's former manager, Rip Holland, which Henry balks at because of some vaguely specified falling out and or underhanded dealings. But he has no other options, so he calls Rip up, who luckily has no other options either. I am so back, baby! Oh. Excuse me, sir. This is the last time I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to leave the store. Next up on the list is Zeb, who has been struggling with a honey addiction. Because, you know, he's a bear. Uh -huh, uh -huh. En route, Fred reminisces about the group's big break, where they beat out armpit musician Benny Bogswaggle in a talent contest. Yes, we are barely a half hour in, and we're resorting to armpit fart jokes. It makes you long for the subtle wit of elf bowling. So after that Chekhov's gun is set on the mantle, we find Zeb in a honey bar owned by Queen Latifah and her apparently indestructible dignity. The Zeb's over there won't stop calling me Cha-Cha. Set me up, Cha-Cha. Zeb introduces a side quest as he has a $500 honey tab with Queen and he can't leave until he's paid it. Barry, the only member of the cast with any ideas, proposes to wager the tour bus against Zeb's debt in a duel with the house band, Devil Went Down to Georgia style. 
Can I just point out how grossly inaccurate that song is? Very few demons actually own golden fiddles, and those that do are certainly not offering them up as stakes and soul transactions. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, Henry's a little upset that Barry is risking their ride, but Barry is convinced that Zeb can't lose, because he has faith in his heroes, and also if he loses, the movie will be over. But the house band is led by Brian Setzer, so it's not an easy win. Although the Disney Channel original movie rap battle level of the lyrics is an easy sin number four. Despite a screechy start, Zeb wins the duel and the bet, so while they celebrate, the movie checks in with the supporting characters. Reed is amusing himself by destroying models of Country Bear Hall and indulging in a little trademark Christopher Walken scenery chewing. Oh no! Country Bear Hall has been crushed! And Ham and Cheats show up at the actual hall asking about Barry's whereabouts. Where is he? Henry took him. Henry took him? In the bus. Being police officers, the two automatically assume the worst about a marginalized population and conclude Barry has been kidnapped. Meanwhile, the road trip moves on to Tennessee. The character, not the state, who is a marriage counselor, although not a very good one, as he's still heartbroken over his failed relationship with the band's keyboardist, Trixie. Took off with some rich millionaire real estate guy. A panda. <sighs> What's with the pandas? They get everything. Is this bear racism? I'm pretty sure this is bear racism. And oh look, here's Jennifer Page as a waitress gushing over the title characters and doing a cover of one of their songs. This is the point where the cameo performances start to get really tiresome. Again, this movie clearly wants to be the Blues Brothers for the family demographic, but instead of Aretha Franklin singing Think, we have someone you may remember from 20 years ago doing this. The mood is brought down as the Bears see an APB for themselves on the news, and Ham and Cheats walk into the diner. They manage to beat a hasty retreat and get a head start because the cops are blindingly stupid and the undercranked car chase is on. How about a little thing I call hiding in the car wash? Uh, how's that work? We hide in the car wash. If you don't think that's a song cue, you have a lot more faith in this movie than I ever did. So, after we have a good laugh over the cops getting a scalding hot wax, our protagonists pull up to a roadside hotel where, conveniently, Trixie is the resident lounge act. And it turns out, whatever issues she and Tennessee had are easily solved by a Bonnie Raitt and Don Henley duet by proxy. Can love stand the test? Well, at least someone is enjoying the show, even if it is in a winking, hey, let's compliment our own performances manner. The last member of the group to be rounded up is Ted, which may be tricky as he is steadfastly refusing Henry's calls. So they pull up to Ted's address, where it appears he's doing so all right for himself that Elton John is doing his gardening. Ted Betterhead, he's uh, an old friend of mine. Um, <laughs> is he here? No, he's uh, not here. He's probably still at the country club at the wedding. Elton's directions are vague enough that you can probably see this bait-and-switch coming, but we still have to sit through Ted posturing about how he refuses to look backward, and this whole exercise seems kind of pathetic, no arguments, and tossing them out before his brother Fred, Fred and Ted are brothers, by the way, goes to confront him and discovers the truth. It's not unusual to have fun with anyone. Despite having his pretense of success shattered, Ted still refuses to go along with Fred, so Fred falls back on plan B, physical assault. Ted takes being knocked out and abducted surprisingly well, but he's still not on board with this get the band back together thing, especially since he's the only one who realizes there's no real plan beyond get the band back together. And so we come to the long-expected airing of old grievances scene. 
I'm the reason we stay together, Zeb. Did any of you, any of you ever thank me? Barry insists that the Country Bears are family because that's what they said in the magazines, but Ted disabuses him of that notion, which Barry takes about as well as live-action Simba seeing his dead father. Realizing that his true family was the one he left behind, Barry decides to... run all the way back home? Mom? Apparently, yes, he does. Okay, then. Barry has a heartwarming reunion with everyone, including Dex, who has given up and decided to embrace the madness. Back at the tour bus, the bears find Barry's scrapbook and read a touching essay. I can't really say Zeb is my hero, or Fred, or Ted, or even Tennessee. But as the country bears, what they can do together makes them my heroes. Realizing what's really important namely bringing joy to practically the only other humanoid bear in existence, the country bears drive up to the Barrington's house to apologize and invite Barry to perform in their big concert, which means it's time for some third act complications. The bus was stolen. It was at Thimblefell. <laughs> Wait, what? Was Reed following them? Where has he been in relation to the main characters all this time? Is the journey between Bear Hall and the Barringtons a long bus ride or a quick jog? Is the ability of these characters to just pop up where they need to be a deliberate joke or just really bad writing? And doesn't the fact that I have to ask that question already indicate the answer? Dex, who I'm starting to believe is the only character in the entire movie with a functioning brain, realizes they can Chekhov's gun, Barry's old tracking collar, and use it to locate the bears. And speaking of Chekhov's guns, Reed reveals his true motivations for destroying Bear Hall. For those of you who thought Captain Hook was the low point of Christopher Walken's career, all I can say is I'm as surprised as you are. But the Barringtons and Ted race to the rescue, nearly getting the latter vehicularly homicided several times in the process, and the band is freed. Big you-know-what hugs all around, and all is right with the world as they travel to the concert. Dex and Barry are getting along, Mom Barrington and Trixie are female bonding, Elton John is performing on the soundtrack. But that doesn't seem to matter, as when they arrive at Bear Hall, the place is empty. So yeah, Rip, remember him? Got bought out by Reed slash Benny, so the concert never got promoted. But that doesn't seem to matter, as Big Al reveals he just rerouted the traffic around to the other side of the hall so that they wouldn't park on his lawn. Al is very protective of his lawn, trust me, it's been an entire thing this whole movie. On. What about narrative justification? Who are these people? How did they know to show up? Do they have enough money to cover your mortgage? You can't defeat me by some random deus ex machina. I'm Christopher fucking Walken! But so it is. The hall is saved, Barry is an official country bear now, and it's time for the big finale number. I would have chosen something more upbeat, but then I wouldn't have made this movie to begin with, so there you go. Whatever metric you want to measure the country bears by, it falls short. There are better theme park attraction movies, better road comedies, better recording artist cameo fests, better Christopher Walken villains, and better showbiz soap opera pastiches. There's even better country bear jamboree characters than the ones that wound up in this movie. So, the Court of Musical Hell condemns the producers to have their heads mounted on a wall in tribute to Buff, Max, and Melvin, who were cruelly ignored by this adaptation. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned, and please let the next case be anything but a bad Disney cash grab. No, no, I didn't mean anything. Don't you dare use that as an excuse to send me something truly heinous like, oh, for fuck's sake!